Is that slightly better? Slightly. No. Anyway, you see the pictures. That's the important stuff. <laughs> So those are the vehicles. Uh, Spaceship Two is in the middle. It's a uh, six-passenger, two-pilot vehicle. Uh, that's the spaceship part, and then the uh, thing around it is the carrier aircraft um, that takes the vehicle pair up to 50,000 feet. Is that at San Francisco? Yep. We got to do a cool flight into SFO for the opening of Terminal 2 last year. Got to buzz the Golden Gate Bridge. So that's Spaceport America, which is a uh, new spaceport in southern New Mexico that we'll be flying out of. Uh, there's Richard's back. There. And then this is a uh, feather test. Well, you'll see. Go through a period of uh, energy. <laughs> Our vehicle does this uh, sort of bendy thing, so it, it uh, folds itself sort of in half uh, for re-entry. Um, and I think this was the first time that we did it. This was a few months ago. Um, really good ground track. Yeah. So that just gives you a taste of uh, Virgin Galactic. So it's, it's what we're trying to do is um, uh, open space for the rest of us. So for um, 50 years, you know, space has been sort of the province of the triathlete, superhuman, PhD, amazing people who are astronauts and cosmonauts. Um, but, but NASA hasn't spent as much attention on sort of opening space up for, for those of us who, who would like to go, um, who maybe don't have, maybe this audience, I don't know, the built audience is very talented, so maybe you do all have PhDs and are triathletes and everything, but for those of you who don't, you know, um, when do we get to go? It's, and so this company and others, like Xcor and, and others, are, are trying to do that, um, to open space up so that, uh, so that we have um, an opportunity to go at a, at a much lower cost, and I think that that'll have a sort of a profound impact on humanity um, to, uh, to have not just, so in the last 50 years, about 10 people a year on average have gone into space. So about 500 people have gone into space. And, and we now have, um, we'll, be, we'll be announcing, I think next week or maybe the week after that we've now signed up um, 500 people um, on, our, on our waiting list. And, and, uh, and that'll be a really exciting moment because we will be able to fly in the first year or two uh, as many people who have been to space as, as the number of people who have been to space ever. Um, and, uh, and then to keep doing that, to fly, fly hundreds more, eventually thousands more, and then tens of thousands. Um, and I think that will have a radical sort of impact on, on humanity because, you know, the people who go up into space come back changed. They come back, you know, with a profound uh, and different perspective on, on, on the planet. And, you sort of think about that effect over time as thousands of leaders and, uh, and folks will, uh, will go into space and come back down and, and sort of, I view this as potentially the thing that sort of saves us from, from, uh, from a bad fate, you know, to have people go up and have that planetary perspective so that, you know, they, they view our, uh, our planet as, as, a, as a spaceship, you know, as a very precious spaceship. And, uh, and so I think it's, it, it will be one of, at least, one of the major shifts that humanity goes, goes through in the, 20, uh, in the 21st century, 22nd century. 
you know, the next the next few centuries, as more and more thousands of people get to go into space and uh, and uh, and experience that worldview shift. So anyway, that's what Galactic is. I'll stop now, and then um, my wife Loretta is a, is, a, is an amazing person. She she started Yuri's Night and, and various other things, and she'll talk to you about all that stuff. So thanks very much. On Mac, you just hit play. Uh, 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 play button. So, so rocket science is easy, but Windows is hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a space so it's 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 really been fun for us to get to go on this sort of space adventure together. Um, you know, like we met at a space conference, and you know we both had this passion for space. I've been passionate about space ever since I was six years old. Um, you know, I remember like playing the spaceship under the stairs at my you know cousin's house. Like that, um, and in 2004, uh, we had the opportunity to train to work for Zero Gravity Corporation. Um, you know, at that time, that was you know the well, it's right, even still right now, it's the closest you can come to, to go get a space, you know, sort of commercially. Um, we so we've been flying since 2004. I'm one of nine flight directors um, for the company, so we're FAA certified flight attendants. Basically, I can. I know how to point with two fingers, um, and I know how to put an oxygen mask on. Uh, but it's a lot of fun. We uh, we have a 727, uh, and we uh, it's all cargo planes. So the seat we have seats in the back, but the whole rest of the plane is all um, open uh, and they're padded, so you can just you can just float around free. And uh, that's my mom. <laughs> got to bring her on a flight once, and it's uh, it's really an amazing experience. I've done it, you know, almost a hundred times now. I've done almost a hundred flights now, uh, and we we fly out of uh, Florida and um, Las Vegas most regularly, but we also sometimes do special flights in San, San Jose and LA and stuff and charters. Uh, and it's about five thousand dollars to do the flight, and you do you know the training and then. You, but the experience of just floating weightless is just such a, an extraordinary like amazing it, it, for me it felt like you know so natural like going home like back in the womb like just at first it's so bizarre and like physics doesn't behave the way you're used to you're like your brain is like whoa, 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 what's up with that? it's not supposed to do that you know but it's funny those of us who fly a lot you know we you get adapted really quick and so we know how to move in surgery and like get from one side of the plane to the other and like the people who are their first time are like oh. um, but it's really and if you ever get the chance to do it it's um uh, amazing opportunity uh, just to sort of shift your consciousness around a little bit um, and get a little taste of what it'll be like when we're going to space. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we're most proud of as a company is when we flew uh, Dr. Stephen Hawking. Um, you know, he's only got uh, muscle control of like a couple of muscles in his face, and that's it. And um, when we, you know, we, we define mission success on this flight as one one problem, getting him to be able to experience weightlessness and being free of his wheelchair, you know, once, and uh, he was just having such an amazing time that we ended up, he ended up demanding eight parabolas from his doctors, <laughs> uh, like, I can do it, you know, you know, communicating with them how he does, um, and it was just, it was the biggest smile I've ever seen on his face. Um, I also got invited to be on an expedition with James Cameron, I'm, I'm trained as an astrobiologist, you know, when I was doing the academic thing. Um, and he was looking for scientists to take with him to the bottom of the ocean, to the hydrothermal vent sites in the middle of the Atlantic and some in the Pacific Rim um, for a documentary he was making. And um, so these are some, some photos from that, those, that experience. And I, I share it because that was sort of my other, you know, the other analog, the other way I play space. You know, it's like, it's kind of like a Soyuz capsule. It's about, you know, it's a small diameter titanium sphere with a Russian pilot. Pretty cool, uh, you know. And you got and there's three of us in there, and it's a confined space for many hours and extreme temperatures, and, and it's an extreme environment. You know, there's no 911 out in the middle of the Pacific. You know, nobody. I'm mean, sorry, the Atlantic. No one's gonna. You know, there's no helicopter can land on the on the boat. No plane can. You know, it's like you're on your own. So you really had to deal with a lot of the risk. It got, the risk of what we do got more real for me when I was like choosing to climb into this vehicle. And, drop to the bottom of the seafloor, you know, two two hours down, two hours underwater, two hours straight down. You know, you're like, wait, 
what if I don't come back? You know, you have to really, you know, before all, all my generation were all cavalier, I'd go to Mars one way, you know, like, but when you actually have to do it, you know, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting experience. Uh, so this is us at the bottom, bottom one, of the, one of the dives we did um, in the hydrothermal vents, some of the crazy animals we saw. I love these guys. This is like, these like blinking neon lights. I didn't want to tell anyone about them because I thought they'd think I was crazy, but then I saw it in a science textbook, so it's, I can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and after the, so that was 2003, and then uh, Richard Branson also got involved, decided he wanted to get involved with some ocean stuff, so they sponsored a, a a new submarine, submersible, to dive to the bottom of the Mariners Trench, which is the deepest point in the ocean, a big canyon in the sea floor. Uh, and so we're, so I'm just doing some consulting for them right now, which is sort of fun. So I get to sort of use some of my ocean background and uh, some of my virgin family connections um, to be involved with that project, which has been a lot of fun as well. Um, so one of the things that George and I did uh, once we started dating, so we, you know, we were just colleagues, you know. Then something happened. Uh, but we decided we wanted to go into space together. It was sort of like, wait, you can't go into space without me. I'm like, well, you can't go into space without me. So we decided we should go together. So we bought um, honeymoon tickets to fly with Galactic. And it's been a really amazing time. Um, it's a fun, fun company to be a part of. Um, we got to do some centrifuge testing, uh, which is cool because I've never experienced six Gs before. You know, I experienced zero G. But uh, six Gs, you know, is a whole different matter. It's not nearly as fun as zero, I'll tell you. It's, uh, it's actually incredibly uh, un uh, uncomfortable. Luckily, on, on the Virgin uh, spaceship, you only do it for like 0.2 seconds or something. So, but in the centrifuge, they let us do it for like two seconds, you know, just to you know show how tough we are. Um, but uh, it, it, it was so it was just cool, just to try, you know, just good to try different things. Actually, we um, during the centrifuge runs, they did a they do a half profile run, like a, a warm up run, you know, just. A lower, a lower G profile, just to sort of get your, you know, running through what the launch would be like and what the, and the whole thing. And then they say, and then they, okay, when you're done with that, then you'll do the 100% G run. That will do, the, will give you the full profile. And I was like so into it. I was like so focused. I was like so in the moment and pretending it was really happening and I was really on my mission. I was really there and like get into space. And I really felt the zero G when the centrifuge stopped. And then I was like, we came back down. And I was just like so emotionally spent from like having been gone on my first space trip, and I was like, wow, that was awesome. They're like, okay, great, are you ready for the 100% run now? And I was like, no, I can't just go back. I just got back. So it's, it's a fun, fun uh, experience. We also got to go to the unveiling of Spaceship Two um, in Mojave which in, in December, which was crazy. Um, and then these are just the slides I always like to, to give people who are passionate about these things like I am. Um, it's just that reminder, you know, just the, what it takes to do these amazing things uh, is just to keep dreaming big. Um, you know, if, 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 if someone tells you it's, impos it's impossible, then you're probably on the right track. Um, and the other, the other one is to ask for help. Like, it, you know, it took 400,000 people to put a man on the moon. You know, the, the things we're doing require us to work together. It's more than any one of us can do on our own. And it really takes a skill set of being able to connect with other people, get them excited about what you're doing, and work and put aside whatever challenges come up and to keep working together. And that's a really important skill set for all of us to keep developing. Well, you know, especially like, you know, people are really talented and smart and done things on their own. It's like learning how to matrix that and like use all of human talent to make things happen is a real it's like sort of the next level that I'm excited about. And then never give up. You know, fall down six times, get up seven. You know that's what it takes. Is like just gotta keep keep going for it. So um, that's a little bit about me. I'll turn it back to uh, my sweetheart. <laughs> Uh, we could probably keep talking, but why don't we see if anybody has any questions about what we've uh, done and maybe there's a chance to have a little bit of discussion there. Yeah. So, you may not be able to answer this, but when is the first uh, commercial Virgin Galactic flight going to happen? Hmm. Um, when it's ready. <laughs> when it's ready. Yeah, I mean, we're getting closer. Um, it's, uh, uh, we're hoping to do powered flight tests this year, and then uh, that'll continue for a while, you know. Six to twelve months, 
and then uh, we have to bring the operation down to New Mexico, and we have to get commercially licensed. So there's a fair amount of stuff to do. Uh, we're hoping to do it by the end of 2013. But it'll be dependent on the flight test program. Sure it's safe and going through some regulatory yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, all of these vehicles are doing things that, to a greater or lesser extent, if they've been done before, it's been very few times that it's been done before. And so, uh, you know, there are technical challenges associated, you know, significant technical challenges. And, um, and uh, you know, and, and tackling those technical challenges with relatively small teams, relatively small amounts of money. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's, I mean, it's an interesting, it's an interesting enterprise, but, but we're making good progress. We've got a lot of great, great people involved, and uh, so pretty close. Yeah, uh, yeah maybe. What's the TSA process like? Going into the <laughs> <laughs> training uh, program really short because you know pe the people have gone to the space station had to go to Russia for six months and learn Russian and it's very it's, it's a very serious commitment um, so our goal is to keep it down to three-day training so that you know if you have a professional person they could take you know a week off of work come down to New Mexico do the training get ready you know get, meet their crew you know uh, and then go do their flight um, so you know it, it, trying to keep it you know a doable and, and open to you know many people as possible one thing I'd add to that is what, we'd, what I'd really love to do is to be able to give everybody a microgravity experience and a hygiene experience because I think that, and, and if, if possible, it'd be great to give them a little bit of an acrobatic air, aircraft experience as well because I think those are the three things that are going to make people sort of like blow their minds a little bit, you know, like the high G part at the front and the end, you know, is very trainable, but it's not very comfortable the first time you do it. So, you know, we'd love to be able to give people that experience. Similarly, in, in microgravity, when you're floating around because you'd be able to get out of your seat and uh, float around. You know, we prefer that people not get kicked in the head, you know, by their folks who are they're flying with. And so that's trainable as well, but you have to try it a couple times. And then similarly, I think it will be a new experience for people to be flying on their backs, you know, flying straight up. And so, you know, ideally it would be nice to give people that experience as well. So we're thinking about ways that we can do that as well. So anyway, but you captured it. Well. I just want to add real quick. Uh, my first zero-G flight, I was terrified. I mean, there was a lot of performance anxiety because it was sort of a job interview too. If you don't do well, you don't get to work for the company. <laughs> you know, if you throw up on or something. Uh, so, you know, there's that performance anxiety. But just the, doing something for the first time, you know, like the first time you drove on the freeway or the first time you ride a roller coaster, like just that the unknown is scary. Um, and so I was, you know, a lot of, you know, you're kind of distracted a bit because you're just sort of caught up in your anxiety. So one of the goals is to have people have, you know, done IG or done zero G before so that that's sort of out of the way, you're like, oh, I can, I know I can do six Gs, I know I can do zero Gs, done that. And then you're able to be more present and more able to appreciate the experience you're having. So that's awesome. Well said. Okay, a couple other questions. I think there's one over here. Yeah. Yeah, I, I so the, the suborbital experience is really awesome. And it's kind of like, if I had the main sign me up right now. But the, the thing that I'm, in a slightly longer term, super excited about is how you make the jump to, to orbital, right? And like, this whole other world of science fiction kind of things so opens up. Do you have any personal uh, desires or, or plans of how or that the organization will get there or whether you care at all to get there? Well, Richard really would love to do orbital. I think he's even more interested in point to point, high speed point to point travel. Uh, so, like going from LA to Australia in an hour or 45 minutes or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, there's clearly a lot of ways to, uh, you know, which we, I mean, we really haven't in increased the speed of jet travel in 50 years, which is crazy, but true. We've actually shrunk it. We've shrunk it, yeah. <laughs> Especially, well, I'm not going to go into TSA, but. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, no, so we're we're certainly interested in that. We're thinking about ways to, to potentially do things there someday. But, but really, I think our friends at SpaceX and, and others are doing just incredible work there and, and thinking about, uh, really, really the, the challenge is that these orbital flights are, are involve tremendously more energy. Um, they're 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 more expensive. Um, currently, you know, um, the challenge is we use expendable rockets, 
And so I think the things that SpaceX and a couple other places are thinking about is, uh, is that reusability. And, and that's, that, cause that, that's what will bring the price down over time. And, uh, and that's, what, that's what we think, that's why I think that suborbital is so important, because we can sort of test out these technologies for very high rate um, space operations and hopefully mature some of those. They're not directly, not all of them will be directly applicable to orbital, but some of them will be. And the hope is that we can mature that into orbital um, someday, I think. So, but you know, um, our friends at SpaceX are doing some really great stuff in terms of thinking about how to make their first stage and eventually the second stage reusable capsule. I think the hope is to have that be reusable as well. So they're doing fantastic stuff. Other questions? Uh, maybe right here and then the just, uh, I heard that uh, Bert Ken is uh, retiring. Is he still involved in Scale or? Yeah, I mean, he's retired uh, now from Scale. I think he's Chairman Emeritus or something like that. But uh, he still talks with the engineers there, and, and he's part of a couple of other projects that are bouncing around. So. He's not playing golf all the time. Yeah, well, what's the goal for turnaround for, for, for the vehicle? How many flights a year would you have as a goal? I mean, I think a, a nice aspirational goal would be to fly every day. Um, you know, theoretically, you could fly them even more frequently. But, uh, but uh, you know, I think to, to start, we'll probably fly once a week, you know, once every two weeks, something like that, until we understand how it works. And then, and I mean, even that, you know, would be super slow from an aviation perspective and super fast from a space perspective. And so, you know, uh, the, the space shuttle flew at maximum, I think, what, like eight times or uh, seven, what? Three in, in a year. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, so whatever the number was, it's, it's, it's nowhere near, you know, weekly or daily. So, a couple more questions and then we'll... And is that per launch vehicle? Are you making more than one of those passenger things? So each one would be maybe up to once a day or you mean on average? Um, I think I think aspirationally we'd like to have a vehicle fly once a day. Um, we are we set up a manufacturing company in Mojave to um, to build additional copies of the vehicle. So our, our, our hope is to build an initial fleet of spaceships and, and carrier aircraft. A couple more. We got one in the back and then here. Yeah. Uh, I found that if I drink a lot of water, if I'm in a small airplane, I'm much less likely to get nauseous and vomit. But then I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> That's as far as I got hearing that problem. And I heard that you were supposed to maybe spin yourself on a piano chair all the time. Less likely to you. And that's also about as far as I've gotten. <laughs> on solving that problem, that you guys had any experience I have a lot of experience with that problem. Um, I, I am susceptible to motion sickness. We have other people, other crew for our airplane who are not. They, we call them, you know, like bulletproof. You know, Tim can spin around and flip around as much as he wants and he doesn't feel a thing. And me, you know, if I'm driving in a car, you know, I, and I'm reading something, you know, I'll have to stop at some point and roll the window down and look forward, you know. Like a normal person, right? <laughs> um, so that was one of the reasons that the job was scary. So I've been very, I've had a very much had my eye on what can I do on the plane to keep myself comfortable and keep all my, get, like all of our passengers comfortable. Um, and, you know, a lot of it is, yeah, it's definitely eating what you normally, you know, having in your, your stomach have food in it, like, solid, I don't know how you say that, you know, oatmeal or saltines, or, you know. And we have certain things we tell people to avoid, you know, like caffeine and carbonation, and, uh, citrus and things like, you know, anything that will upset your stomach. And then also just like looking forward, not moving your head, you know, like if you're spinning on a chair and you're like, you know, doing this with your head, your ears are, you know, going crazy so you know if we're doing a zero you know the 2g pull out or something you know make sure i tell them people to focus on one point and stare at it don't be like whoa isn't that cool you know <laughs> because you don't want your ears you know so you're trying to keep your head stable and keeping cool um you know i'll, I'll tell the cockpit lower the temperature in the cabin you know because people are starting to sweat you know like when you're, when you're starting to feel you know you roll the window down you know so like keeping cool cool is good um and not spinning uh, a lot of a lot of times they see in the videos you know, people doing the spins and the somersaults, and so they want to do the spins and the somersaults. Um, but I tell them, okay, wait till parabola 15 to do that. You know, the first, because A, you can do that on the ground. You can, you know, you can spin around later. But, um, but what you can't do is stand on the ceiling or float in the middle of the room. And I find those to be way more interesting, like to just be like, 
you know, zend out, like, a <laughs> or just to be, like, standing on the ceiling, like, watching every, you know, one go by. Uh, you know, so it's like, you know, also, it's just, you know, changing the way you behave. Okay, uh, maybe... We have two, two more. Okay, but a lot of people may need to go ahead. So, how much do the flights cost, and how much is your zero G time to get? The zero G flights or the space flights? Both. The zero G flights are about five thousand dollars a flight. The suborbital flights are two hundred thousand dollars a flight. Um, and amount of time you get fifteen parabolas. Uh, we do. We start with one Martian, so you're sort of like just a little bit lighter. And then we do two lunar, so it's like one small step for man, kind of bouncing, just sort of you know ease you into it. And then we do twelve uh, zero parabolas, and they're about twenty seconds of weightlessness in a zero gravity parabola. So. From the moment you start rising off the pads, you know, you've got 20 seconds to sort of swim around. So, um, and, and a virgin flight, did you say this? Or two, $200,000. So these parabolas um, are for flight pads. Yeah, so we go from like 34,000 feet to like 24,000 feet. And over the top, you get the zero, and on the bottom, you know, you get the 2G. Organizationally, um, just for this session, I think we have another session that sort of links into what Loretta works on Yuri's night. So. Uh, that'll be going on for so we'll probably run a few more minutes of questions. If people need to go, they should just feel free to, to leave. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll probably do just a few more questions and then we can before, go into the URI's net. Okay, uh, just real quick, um, I think that kind of like works into what we're going to do next with this stage whenever questions, if they're ever done for George and Loretta. Um, I think it's really, I'm so pleasantly surprised. I'm Simone, by the way, so <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I am a Bill co-founder, and it was my dream to have a space grade to, <coughs> to build this year. Um, and I just wanted to thank all of you guys for kind of trusting my vision enough to come down here, even though this is a greater event, and you know, you guys might not be used to having space speakers at like some random event that you've never even heard of before. So thank you. And to see uh, um, old school builders and like fairly new builders, you know, be here, or come here to hear uh, about space. Like this is amazing. This is really what I really, really wanted to see. So thank you guys. Like. Um, <laughs> Into, I, I really hope that you guys become as awe-inspired about space as I have, especially over the last couple of years. Um, and you know, uh, essentially, you know, come up with interesting ways that we can get all of our asses off the planet. So. <laughs> okay, so I give it back to George and Loretta. Thank you guys so much. Bye. Okay, we've got a question there. Yeah, what uh, what kind of outfit will the uh, will the occupants of the uh, spacecraft wear? Is there some kind of pressure suit system, or is it just relying completely on the integrity of the hull? So if anything happens, uh, have a nice day. Yeah, or not, as the case may be. We we we, uh, we are still thinking about it. Um, uh, ideally, we'd like to get a get to a place where it's a shirt sleeve environment, like an airplane, where you don't have to uh, wear a spacesuit. Um, it, it may be that in early test flights we have uh, suits of some kind, and then maybe once we have confidence in the uh, the frame, we have very large quantities of uh, pressurized air, and and because of sort of physics, the flight's not going to last that long no matter what. So you're going to get back down. We think we can feed most reasonably sized leaks um, uh, if if we did have one, uh, and the flight will be done pretty quickly. So um, so I, I think we're not fully finalized on that decision. Also because yeah. you have a lot of windows, which is a good thing on the spacecraft. Yeah. So. yeah. That's a good point. So yeah, so stay tuned. We'll see what happens. Yeah. In the movie Apollo 13, apparently a lot of the orbital scenes were actually shot on a craft of that sort, zero G. Was zero G involved with that? Do you know how that was handled? Or who they really were? I think they were at, that was before we were doing commercial operations, that was um, done on the NASA KC-135 um, back in the 90s, um, but I, what, I know we were involved in that in some way. I mean, the company was forming and getting involved. In, we, we, and we've definitely done a lot of photo shoots since then. In fact, you can go on YouTube and see the Justin Bieber perfume commercial. <laughs> there are some scenes in that were shot. <laughs> okay, why don't we do two last questions and then we'll, or one last question and then we'll talk about Yuri's head. Yeah? Great. 
Any other questions? If not, that's fine. We'll just talk about yours. Yeah. So, um, can the experience like how, how, how much difference would that be compared to the acrobatic flight like on the Um. So the question is sort of like how does uh, how does a zero g flight or a or a space parabolic uh, suborbital space flight differ from a, uh, an acrobatic airplane flight? So. Um, for one thing, um, ideally, from a from a at least from a suborbital space flight, mm -hmm. you'll go tremendously much higher, right? I mean, so you know, an acrobatic flight will be sort of twenty thousand feet. You know, we're going to go up to sort of order of magnitude three hundred thousand plus feet. You know, and so you'll be able to see the curvature of the Earth and the black sky of space. And the, I think the view is really the most important thing, in my opinion. Um, secondly, you know, you'll be able to get out of your seat and experience several minutes of microgravity. So. Uh, you know, with zero G, you can experience them sort of in 15 to 25 second chunks. So this will be, you know, three to four to five minutes of, of microgravity at a time. Um, and uh, and then the fat last thing is that you get to have astronaut wings. You know, when you when you fly to space, and that's uh, important for some people. Important certainly for our customers uh, that they get to experience or have that sort of lifetime peak experience. Uh, yeah, maybe last question here. Uh, Virgin Galactic intend to offer, as XCOR does, suborbital science opportunities like payload opportunities? Yeah, um, so uh, we've sold a few seats to NASA, uh, sorry, a few, few flights to NASA. Um, and it's the same kind of thing, so we've designed some racks and, uh, and uh, yeah, we'll fly, fly scientists and, and, uh, and their experiments. What about the uh, second stage to orbit? Anything uh, external payload? Yeah, we're thinking about that. Um, uh, it's it, it, we wouldn't, I don't think, fly off of Spaceship Two. We would do something from the carrier aircraft, White Knight Two. But um, uh, but yeah, it's an it's an idea, and and I think it's an interesting business area. So I mean, we'll see, maybe something. Uh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Question is animals. So we actually have a customer who is quite wealthy, who is really close with their dog, and, uh, and he would love to take his uh, his dog up. And uh, I think that won't happen in the first group of flights, but you know, at some point maybe we have a dog flight, you know, and we sort of say, anybody want to go up with their dog, and maybe we'll sell three seats to humans and three seats to dogs. And it'd probably freak the dogs out a little bit, but they'll have to do zero g. Yeah, you train them. Anyway, okay, so I think what we'll do is we'll pause here. We're going to talk about something called Yuri's Night next, which is this global celebration of space, which has always been very connected into some of the communities that maybe Bill intersects with in some ways. So if you're interested in talking about that, Loretta will lead the discussion there. And if not, uh, thanks for coming by and talking about space with us. So, thanks.